you have your Bibles, John 16 is where we are this morning. John 16. We are back in the middle of a study of the Gospel of John and um, just going chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse, and studying what Jesus was teaching his early disciples, what Jesus was doing, and how he was living his life. And through this passage, we are seeing how we are called to be like Jesus. And so last week, we looked at a very difficult passage that two weeks ago we looked at where Jesus told us that we are loved, that we are his family, that we belong to him, that he loves us. And that as soon as he says that, he says, hey, because I love you, the world is going to hate you. And so he takes a very positive message and then he turns around and he goes, hey, they're going to hate you because they hated me. They're going to turn their backs on you because they turned their backs on me. And they're going to despise you because they despise me. And why? Because you're not of the world. You're different. You're you're born from above. You are different. And the world doesn't understand you. And the world will hate you. And now this morning, Jesus continues and dives even deeper into that. And he shows us how in a world that will not love Jesus, in a world that rejects Jesus, in a world that turns away from Jesus, how we are called to live our life on mission for Jesus. How are we to influence the people around us? How are we to point, love our community, love our neighbors, love the people that God brings into our lives? And so in John 16, Jesus dives into Jesus, the world, and mission. Now, we live in a beautiful world, and yet we live in a crazy world, a world full of the common grace of God, in art, in music, in landscape, in the faces of a newborn child. A world full of incredible creatures and breathtaking creation. And yet we also live in a world full of sin and full of brokenness. We've succeeded in tearing down every good thing that God has given us. Instead of using things to love people, we use people to love things. And until Jesus comes back for his children, we'll mess up the world even more. We'll tear it up even more. But what is this world that Jesus talks of? To some, the world is something we embrace and we immerse ourselves in. To others, it's something we run away from. It's a reason we collect canned foods and pray for the rapture to quickly happen in light of all that's going around us. But what really is the world? How do we relate to it? How do we keep from being conformed to it? We looked at this briefly last week. In the Bible, especially in the Gospel of John, Jesus teaches us that the world is a system, a system made up not just of irreligious people, but a system made up of religious people who oppose and hate Jesus. And it's important to recognize that in Scripture, when Scripture talks about the world, the world is simply an alternative to following Jesus. And within, the, and within the religion called the world, there are different gods, different saviors, different heavens, and different hells. And you can find these on the front pages of every magazine and newspaper and website you go to. There is out-of-shape hell with a savior called a new diet or exercise machine to get you into slim heaven where you can worship your body. There is out-of-touch hell with a savior called technology, with the latest iPhone or the Galaxy, which is a hot item to get you up to date, in touch, if you would worship it. There is loser hell, with a savior called touchdowns and home runs and goals and buckets to get you into winter heaven, that if you would worship it. There is bad reputation hell, with a savior called good works and church attendance and penance to get you into a good religious person heaven if you will worship it. To the gods of this religious world are very slick, sophisticated, and they demand your time, your talent, your treasure. And no matter what area of life you are in, they are, all, you, the, they are always operating off of a religious system. And the essence of this religion is self-attainment, self-salvation. It is in direct opposition to grace, to the gospel. And if you go with grace... If you follow Jesus and if you embrace the gospel, you will be swimming upstream and it's not going to be easy. You'll find yourself opposed on every single front. 
See, the world likes a pattern. It likes to be able to label a person and to classify him and to put him into a pigeonhole. And anyone who does not conform to the world will certainly meet trouble. And it is into this world that Jesus is calling his disciples into. And it is into this world that Jesus is calling you and I into. And Jesus wants to give the disciples and us a reality check before he sends us. And he reminds us that it's going to be hard. He wants them to know the cost of following him. Up until this point, he has stressed the positives of following him. He's talked about eternal life, and he talked about the gift of the Holy Spirit, of power and joy and community, all these treasures and things that we, we love because of our relationship with Jesus. But now he begins to talk about being hated, being shunned, possibly even being killed simply because you follow Jesus. And in John 15 and 16, the world hate or hated is listed seven times in just those two chapters. Jesus wants us to know that we're no longer part of this world system, and it's not going to be pretty for us if we are fully committed to him. It is a war that you're in, and wars, my friends, are ugly. There is relational sharpness, and there is friendly fire. Fellow believers around you, will be around you will be spiritually shot, and no doubt bullets will fly by your ears as well. Some of you will get hit for following Jesus. And so we carry the torch of the gospel into this world system that we need to understand and embrace several truths if we're going to make it for Jesus. In John 16, Jesus gives us five things, five truths that we need to know when we live our life on mission for him. Five things we need to know when we go and embrace our community. Five things we need to know when we love our neighbors. Five things we need to know when we live to the beat of a different drummer. Five things. Number one, the animosity of the world. Jesus already told his disciples back in John 15 that this world, the religious system, will hate you because it hated him. Why did they hate Jesus? Why? Because he confronted them of their self-righteousness, their self-salvation pursuits, and they didn't like that very much. They didn't like his miracles because it showed them up, showed them up because many times the things they were doing for people that the religious, things, religious people didn't approve of. They often thought their works were good, but standing next to Jesus, they realized that they were nothing compared to him. And even when one of them approached Jesus on how to fulfill the law, Jesus gets down to telling a story about a man who was mugged on the road and about a man who helped him. This religious man walked away disappointed in his own righteousness and his own works. Look at me, John 16, verse 1. I've told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. Jesus told them this to sober them up. It's not going to be all fun and games following Jesus. The reason he tells them this is, is so that when it happens, they won't be the ones collecting canned food and sitting in a fetal position, running away from the world. But he tells them these specific things will happen to them. Excommunication will happen to you. Murder will happen to you. Persecution will happen to you. You'll be put out of synagogues and places of worship. And these are significant things because they're the center of religious life for these people. These are also the social and economic life of these people. Following Jesus and taking the gospel into a religious world system was going to cost these guys everything. Their friends would shun them. Their family would exile them. They'd lose their jobs. Or if they were self-employed, then they'd lose their customers. And all of them, except the Apostle John, would lose their lives at the hands of their persecutors. And the crazy thing is that those who did these things would think that they were doing it for God. They would think that they were doing the right thing. They would be eliminating a threat that was to their society. You remember Paul, before he got saved, he, in the name of God, began to kill Christians and began to persecute them. He realized that if this Jesus thing caught on in their community, whole industries would be shut down. And you read through Acts and you find out, even after Paul comes to faith, how they try to kill him for preaching the gospel because it fringed on their livelihood. Friends, following Jesus will cost you relationships. 
following Jesus for these guys cost them jobs, cost them money, cost them not just in the world out there, but in the religious world that Jesus was talking about. It will cost relationships with people in church as people will abandon you and turn on you because you get serious about Jesus. It's okay that you come to church and do religious duty, but when you begin to live your life on mission for Jesus, when you begin to pour your life out for the cause of Jesus, when you begin to say, hey, I want to live on mission for Jesus, and you begin to sacrifice time and talent and treasure for the sake of the gospel, when you begin to open the doors of your home so that friends and neighbors could come in for the sake of the gospel, the world just doesn't understand that. Verse 4, but I've told you these things that When their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. Jesus is saying, hey, justice will be served. Their hour will come. I think this is one of the greatest arguments for Christianity. God is a just God who will one day right every wrong, and it is this belief that has enabled Christians to work for peace in the midst of persecution all over the world. It is this conviction that has enabled people to be gracious when they were wronged. It is this conviction that enabled them to say, hey, I will still believe in Jesus when they were facing death. I wouldn't be able to deal with a world if I didn't know that justice would one day be served. Jesus knows that they're all troubled by this. Injustices will be done to them. And Jesus says, listen, they're not going to go unnoticed. I will see them. The hour will come and every sin will be dealt with. And Jesus knows all this too well because he will experience the greatest amount of injustice. For he will be the only one completely, he will be the only completely innocent victim of all time. He will do nothing wrong and everything right, and he will still be murdered for it. And when we walk into the world, we are marching to the beat of a different drummer. And we're following a crucified king, and we proclaim grace, and many will write us off as fools. But listen, it is not all grim news. No doubt the disciples at this moment were thinking, man, can we get a rain check on this? Can we like go back to fishing and doing all this other stuff we're doing? This following Jesus right now doesn't sound very profitable. In fact, it doesn't sound very healthy and it doesn't sound like I'm going to live a long, healthy, rich, prosperous life. The good life now is just not happening. If you're going to follow Jesus, realize that there's going to be animosity. There's going to be people that will not understand you. They might not turn their backs on you and sprout evil things to you, but they just will not understand why you live for Jesus. But in the midst of that, I want you to notice the second truth which Jesus teaches us here is the activity of the Spirit. Verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. I will send him to you. How is it to their advantage that Jesus goes away? How is it to their advantage that Jesus will leave them? If they were just going to go camp out on a mountaintop and roast marshmallows in the Judean countryside, then it will make no sense how Jesus' departure out of this world would benefit them at all. But if they're being sent on mission, if they're they're being told, hey, go live in your communities, live in your neighborhoods and love, then they're going to be spread out all over the world. And Jesus couldn't physically walk with every one of them, but the Spirit could. Friends, the need of the Spirit necessitates the goal of the mission. We need the Holy Spirit because we're on a mission in this world, not just occupying space till Jesus comes back. What is the Holy Spirit going to do to them? Do for them? Look at verse 8. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they don't believe in me about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Jesus is saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is going to be the eye-opener. He will help bring about repentance, or he will help convict to help people see their true condition. Remember, the world doesn't see their need and are mad when you tell them that they cannot make it to heaven by themselves. I don't think that was the Holy Spirit, though. Um, anybody have any idea what that was? Um, and it's not that we're telling them that they need help because what they need is a brand new self. They need to be completely transformed. 
And this Holy Spirit is helping those that we take the gospel to. Helping to help them see the lie of autonomy that you can do whatever you want to do, however way you want to do it. And helping them to see the lie of self-sufficiency that I have everything I need, so I don't need God. Think about how encouraging that is when you are on mission for Jesus. You know people that if you're honest, you think will never come to Jesus. But friends, they're not more powerful than the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can soften their hearts in a moment. And God intentionally puts you into their life. So that how you live and what you say through the spirit that's in you can bring transformation to their lives. One of the epistles says, Christ in you. Peter says this, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Think about that. Everywhere you go, it could be the most difficult place in the world. Christ in you is the hope of glory. When you go into your campuses, Christ in you is the hope of glory. That everywhere you go, Jesus is with you, and he can use you to see lives transformed. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? Peter, Paul, Jesus says three things. One, he'll convict the world of sin because they don't believe in Jesus. Their sin not only brings condemnation, but ignorance of their need. They can't see their need for Jesus. The Spirit is revealing to people that they have a need, a vacancy of the soul. And as Solomon said, there is eternity that is written on their hearts. But the Spirit also, Jesus says here, convicts them of righteousness. How are you convicted of righteousness? Remember, Jesus was speaking to a religious system who was seeking their own righteousness. They, won't just, they just won't use that word, but they're seeking acceptance, approval, glory. They're seeking righteousness. The Spirit is pointing people to Jesus who accomplished their righteousness for them. He's working to reveal to them that what they are thirsting for and what they long for is found in Jesus. And friends, the Spirit is doing this for you and I as well. Every time we look in the mirror and we think that we're a little bit more righteous than we really are, we're constantly making assessments of people out there and judgments of other people, and we're saying, oh, I would never do what they did. But there's a massive log that's sticking out of our own eye. It's not just sin that binds us or blinds us. It's our own righteousness, thinking that we're better than we really are. But the Spirit will also convict, the passage says, the world of its judgment. You know, the world's judgment is all messed up. Their moral compass has been hijacked by sin. The religious world judges by appearance. They say sin is really seen by the type of music you listen to or the clothes you wear, or the political party you're affiliated with. They'll judge you by how you look, or what you wear, or what you accept, or how popular you are. While others say that sin is things like when you don't recycle, or do whatever is acceptable in this world. Our world, in full, with its, all of its irreligion and religion, doesn't have proper judgment. And the world needs to see that Jesus' judgment is perfect and just. He doesn't judge based off of opinion polls or the latest trends that's going on. He judges based on truth. And the propensity of the world and all of us is to minimize our sin in light of someone else's sins. But the Spirit is not only working out there in the world, but He's also working in here in us. He wants to change us before He begins to use us to change the world. Look at verse 12. I still have many things to tell you but you're not going to be able to bear them. And when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what has come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that, what he, takes, that, he, that he takes from what is mine and will declare to you. What truth is it that you and I need to be reminded of? It's the glory of Jesus. The Spirit won't just be working on them, but working on us so that you can reach them. And friends, you and I constantly need to remind 
the spirit, you need the Spirit to remind us of the glory of Jesus. That He is what you need, because without that reminder, you will fall prey to the world's saviors. You'll forget that you need grace. You'll start comparing yourselves to others around you instead of Jesus. You'll start defining sin as what you do and you don't do, instead of defining it as a lack of love in pursuit of Jesus. So we have the activity of the Spirit that's constantly keeping us humble before Jesus. We have two truths so far. We need to see the animosity of the world and the activity of the Spirit. The third truth that Jesus wants us to see from this passage is the assortment of emotions. See, when you live your life on mission for Jesus, it will stir in you all kinds of emotions, and Jesus wants to warn us and to encourage us in this. Being on mission for Jesus is like a roller coaster. It will be the greatest of times, and it will be the worst of times. Greatest of times because there is no greater joy than to serve, love, and proclaim Jesus. There's nothing better. It will be the worst of times because you're on the front lines of a ministry, and there is an enemy that hates you when you are on fire for Jesus, and he will do everything possible to discourage you. Verse 16, a little while and you will no longer see me. Again, a little while, and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he's telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. Again, a little while, you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. They said, what is this that he's saying? A little while, we don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him, and so he said to them, are you asking, about, asking one another about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me? What are they confused about? They're distraught and they're discouraged because Jesus has told them that he's leaving them and that the world will hate him. He is their anchor. He's their hope. He's who they've been pursuing for the last three years. And without Jesus, they will be a sailboat with no sail on uncharted waters. And he just told them that the winds of the world are going to blow against them. And now it seems that Jesus is saying, hey, the winds are going to blow against you. And I'm, by the way, I'm not going to be with you. You're going to be here alone. Look at verse 20. Truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, and the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. And Jesus explains to him here in this passage that in a little while, you, he will die. And they will weep and cry because their hearts will be broken, but their hearts will soon be mended. And what's going to look like a tragedy is soon, is not only going to be seen as a necessity, but it's going to be wonderful. And the disciples experienced this at the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 21, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. When she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because the joy that the person has been born into a world. So you also will have sorrow, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. You know, in giving birth, a mother goes through extreme pain physically and emotionally. Any of you that are parents in this room, you remember the day that your child was born, right? There was a lot of pain, there was a lot of discomfort, there's a lot of worry, and who has, who has any idea what the wife is going through at that moment, right? Um, <laughs> but then you begin to hear the cry of the child. And the doctor takes that child and holds it in her hands and hands it to you and you realize that this is your son, that this is your daughter and all of it was worth it. This is what it's like being on mission together, to take the gospel into a lost and dying world. You experience the height of sorrow and pain as the gospel is rejected and it seems like you're spinning your wheels, yet you also experience the height of joy and relief as you see people responding to Jesus. Don't be surprised to find days where you feel like you could talk to everyone about Jesus, and then the next day you feel like you don't want to even get out of bed. Don't be surprised to find days where you, could, you feel like you could lay down your life in service for Jesus, and then the next day you feel like, man, this isn't, this isn't worth it at all. And sometimes in those moments, you just need to press on, because better days are coming. This is why Jesus keeps telling his disciples, hey, you have to love one another. 
You need to be with one another. You need your community. You need people around you to help you. And you need to know that you have constant access to Jesus no matter how you may be feeling today. Friends, Jesus doesn't answer calls based on your emotional status. He doesn't do, he doesn't go check your Facebook status to find out how you're feeling today. He answers you no matter what your emoji is for today. He will always respond to you. Verse 23. In that day, you will not ask me for anything. Truly, I tell you, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you re- will receive so that your joy may be complete. Friends, this is how we fight through the valleys. This is how we fight through the sorrows. This is how we fight through the discouragement. This is how we fight when people oppose us by going to the man of sorrows. Our goal in asking while on mission is not to get in order to be satisfied with the world, but to get in order to be satisfied with Jesus. We go to him to ask him for open doors for the gospel, and we go to him to ask him to soften our own hearts as we try to live our life on mission for Jesus. We need to remember that as we pursue Jesus on mission in this world, there's going to be animosity because we belong to Jesus. But we also need to be reminded that we're not alone because the Spirit of God is active in us and through us, and that we will have highs and lows as we live our life on mission for Jesus. But the fourth truth that we need to know is the acceptance of God. See, when you're living your life on mission for Jesus, you need some kind of security. You need some kind of affirmation or some truth that you're clinging on to. You need to know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You need to know, like that old hymn says, a love that will not let me go. Verse 25, I've spoken to you, I've spoken these things to you in figures of speech, A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day when you ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the... On on that day you will ask in my name, and I am not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and you have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. See, on mission, on pursuing Jesus, we need to know that despite the upheaval, despite the rejection, despite the sorrow, something will never change. There is one thing that will be always consistent, and that one thing is the love of the Father for you and I, that his love will always be consistent no matter what we are doing and what we are facing in life. Why does it never change? Because the Father loves us because of Jesus not because of our performance. On those days when you feel like you could conquer the world and those days when you feel like you want to stay in bed, the love of God does not change for you one bit. It holds strong and is consistent day in and day out. There will be some bumps on this road, on this mission on pursuing Jesus. And at those greatest points, you need to remember that he loves you not because you have succeeded or things are going well. This will keep you humble as you follow Jesus. And there are some low points in your life where you need to remember that he loves you and the hardship is not happening because God is trying to get back at you. This will keep you encouraged as you pursue Jesus. The love of God will be consistent no matter what you go through in life. Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of Jesus? Can tribulation, can distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are being regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, no matter what you are going through, no matter how you feel, no matter how successful you are or how much you failed, the love of God does not change for you. And friends, that should encourage you to pursue Jesus. 
While the world may hate you, while your friends may reject you, Jesus will always love you. He loved you so much that he made atonement for you so that now he can love you for all eternity. He loves you despite your sin. He doesn't wait to one day approve you after you perform well on earth. He assures you that he loves you now and he's already approved you for eternity. Think about that. It is crazy out in the world trying to love Jesus, to love people, and to tell people about the love of God for them. And in the midst of all of that craziness, in the midst of the ups and the downs, the successes and the failures, there is nothing you and I can do that can change God's unconditional love for us. We can't make it stronger and we can't make it weaker because the Father's love is completely, because the Father's love is completely wrapped up in the Father's love for Jesus and the Father's love for Jesus never changes. He loves you. He loves you. No matter how much you failed this week, you need to hear this morning, he loves you. No matter how well your week was this week, you need to hear he loves you. And look at how the fathers, look at how the love of God is with us even when we fail. Look at verse 32. Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home and you will leave me. And yet I'm not alone because the father is with me. Jesus is saying, hey, within a matter of minutes, in fact, maybe even less than an hour, all of you are going to scatter and run away from me. You're going to be like a dog with its tail between its legs, cowering, running. And as a result, I'm going to be left alone and none of you are around me. But the Father will not abandon me, at least not yet. When Jesus becomes sin on the cross, he will be left alone and he will experience absolute abandonment. And Jesus tells them this so that they don't get cocky, so that they don't think they're all self-reliant and self-sufficient. Jesus consistently keeps knocking them off of their own pedestals on a daily basis. Jesus has been dropping hints all along to keep them humble and to keep them conforming to the world system, from conforming to the world system. Last week we looked at this verse, John 15, verse 18, says that the world hates you, understands it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. See, the reason they're no longer in this religious system is because you've been chosen by God. And Jesus is telling them that you're no longer of the world, but not because you're smarter not because you're morally superior, not because you were the best of the crop. You're no longer of this world because of his pure grace and kindness. And Jesus says that the world will persecute you because they don't know the Father. They don't know the grace. And so don't take it personally. He tells them this to temper their pride and to keep them humble, realizing that if it wasn't for grace, you would be doing the exact same thing. They're loved by God, because they're loved by God. You are loved by God because you are loved by God. We need to embrace the fact that the only difference between us and those caught off in this self-atoning delusional world is grace. We all abandon Jesus in the moment of greatest need. We are the disciples, and yet despite of that, we can't shake the love of God. In the words of the song that was recently written, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. We're hated by the world because we're not, we're not of the world. But in spite of that, the Spirit is in us and active everywhere we go. And in that journey on mission, we're going to experience highs and lows. And regardless of what emotional feeling you are experience, God's acceptance of you does not change. Last point the achievement of Jesus. Verse 33. 
I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. Jesus says, hey, you can have peace. You can have calm within the storm by remembering and embracing the things he said. It's going to be difficult in this world with all of its temptations and practices that, and, and all of its temptations and practices have been overcome. Jesus has conquered. It is where we get the Greek word Nike from. And in chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus said, listen, Satan has no claim on me. He's a defeated foe. In the same way, the world system has no claim on me. He's a defeated foe. Jesus overcame the world by his life. In spite of all the temptations and pain, he stayed the course and he finished the race. He held the line. He also overcame it by his death, by paying the price of sin on the cross. And he finally overcame the world by the resurrection, by rendering the world and death powerless. Friends, the world, just like Satan, has no hold on you because it has no hold on Jesus. If you are in Christ today, you need to claim this truth despite how alluring the world system may be, despite how tempting it is to worship something or someone other than Jesus, despite how crafty Satan may be, Jesus has overcome the world and Jesus has overcome Satan. And because you are in Jesus, you have overcome as well. Remember, the ideology of the world is that you can do it. It's summarized in Nike's slogan, just do it. The world system says, just serve, just give, just devote yourself to a system. And that when you do that, you can gain happiness, you can gain glory, you can gain success. It is all within your grasp, the world says. Every religion in the world will say something similar. You want nirvana? Here are things that you can do. You want God to accept you? Here are five pillars that you should keep. You want to be happy? Here are five steps to happiness and freedom. But only Christianity says you want to be a Christian? You can't do it. You can't do it. Only Jesus can fulfill the Nike slogan because only he can just do it. And friends, he did it. He overcame he achieved victory for you and I, knowing that Jesus has paid it all and rescued you even though you were his enemy, even though you hated him, even though you betrayed him, is what propels you to live your life on mission for Jesus. Others will turn and see you and say, but nothing could stop him. After 50 years of ministry and swimming upstream against the religious world system, a friend asked Charles Simeon, who was a pastor in England back in the, 19, in the 1700s, he, how he surmounted persecution and outlasted all the hatred that he experienced for following Jesus. And he said these words. He said, my dear brother, I don't mind a little suffering for Christ's sake. When I'm going through a hedge or I'm going through some thorns, if my head and my shoulders are safely through, then I can bear the pricklings of my legs. Let us rejoice in remembering that our holy head has surmounted all of our sufferings and triumphed over death. And let us follow him patiently because soon we will be partakers of his victory. My friends, these tables that are set before us remind us that Jesus has surmounted all suffering and rejection and abuse and he has triumphed. And because he has triumphed, you and I have assurance that no matter what happens in this world, we have the assurance that he is with us and that he loves us. He's with us. When you leave these doors and you go into your communities, when you go love your neighbors, when you go back to your dorms, he's with you. As you come to the table this morning to remember the finished work of Jesus, can I invite you to take one second and be, and, and be reminded of the imagery of the cross of Jesus. Would you picture Jesus dying for your sins? And I remind you the gospel one more time as we come to the table. The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believed. 
And yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. We're more sinful than we believe. But we are more loved and accepted than we could ever hope for. As you come, would you let this truth rise in you? Would you let the truth of the gospel propel you to love the people that God has brought you into your life when you leave the doors of this building? Would you let that truth encourage you that no matter how you feel in this present moment that he loves you? Would you let that truth transform you so that you will serve not to get acceptance from God, but because you have already been accepted by God? Friends, if you need prayer this morning, Shannon um, and John are back there available to pray in the back of the sanctuary and would love to pray with you. Whether it's something that the Spirit is convicting you of this morning in regards to the sermon, or if you just want prayer for something that you're going through in life, or if maybe God is bringing someone to your mind, that God is saying, hey, I want you to live on mission and love this person unconditionally and point this person to Jesus, and you just want someone to pray with you, would you head back there? Would you pray with them? Just let them encourage you as they pray over you. And then when you're ready this morning, would you come? grab the elements from the table as we remember the fact that the reason we're here is because he loves us. Because he loves us. He's redeemed us. He's called us his own. And so as we worship this morning, would you meditate on the cross? Would you meditate on his finished work? And then when, when you're ready, would you come? Let's worship together as we take communion. Let's worship.